All right, everybody. Um, I understand that things might have been a little tight in class when I was doing this lecture because of timing. Uh, so I figured I would just make a video explaining through everything again in a way that wasn't so hectic. Um, so what we're talking about is a synthesis of what we did with those lab experiments with magnesium and the grain elevator explosion and so, uh, baking soda and vinegar um, and it's all got to do with energy and matter okay uh, so here uh, you know this is the first slide matter uh, and you can see I've got the three different states of matter on this slide I've got water here I've got ice and I've got clouds I've got solid liquid and gas all different states of matter for water molecules okay so what is matter? Well, matter is anything that has volume, anything that has mass, and anything that's made up of atoms. And what's an atom? Well, um, here's a video uh, that I'll post this PowerPoint on, on Schoology, so you can watch the video again if you'd like, uh, that talks about what an atom is um, and how big an atom is and how dense the nucleus is. So if, let me put this in, in terms that might, might make more sense. If a cell is a basic unit of life, an atom is a basic unit of matter. Okay, Atoms make up everything. They make up wood, they make up your car, they make up you, they make up your food, they make up your pet, they make up um, your cabinets, uh, everything. They don't make up sound or light, those are light waves and sound waves, and they don't make up things like love or death, but they make up every physical thing in the universe. Okay, um, And you can figure out uh, what the different types of atoms are using what's the, called the periodic table. I'm sure you've seen that before. Um, so there are different elements like gold or oxygen or nitrogen. Um, you can look at the table and, and look at them all yourself. Some of them are, are pretty interesting. Um, and they all have unique atoms. So all oxygen atoms are the same and they're all different than carbon atoms. Okay. So uh, this is a table from the book that we've covered before. So we talked about cells and organelles. And what's next comes macromolecules and compound molecules like carbohydrates, lipids, uh, fats, um, proteins, the, the molecules of life. But in order to understand them, we need to understand how they're structured. So that's why we're skipping and learning about atoms and molecules. Okay, So we can, we can understand the middle ground here. So let's talk about anatomy. Uh, I'm pretty proud of this. Hope you appreciate it. I'm sure you're laughing hysterically right now as you watch this super entertaining video, maybe on a Friday night. I'm sure that's what you guys are doing. Uh, anyway, so let's talk about what an atom is constructed of. So all atoms have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons, neutrons, and electrons are subatomic particles. Okay, So protons are positive, electrons are negative, neutrons are neutral. Protons are positive, electrons are negative, neutrons are neutral. Every atom has the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, except for um, a, a, rare, a couple rare cases in things called isotopes, for example. So let's say we have an atom of gold. Gold has an atomic number on the periodic table of 79, meaning it has 79 protons, 79 neutrons, and 79 electrons. And an atom's element, so whether or not it's gold, is defined by the number of protons it has. So if you somehow manage to add an extra proton to gold, bringing it from 79 to 80, it would then become an atom of mercury because mercury has 80 protons. This is impossible. It was, it's called alchemy. You may have heard of it, people trying to turn steel into gold back in the medieval times. It's not possible to add protons to matter to, to change its, uh, the element it's made out of. Um, so... That's, uh, that's, that's why the number of protons matters, because it, it helps define, or it does define the element, elemental identity. So the atom is structured into a nucleus and the cloud. Okay, the nucleus is where the protons and the neutrons are. It's very dense, as that video demonstrates. Um, and the cloud is made up of electrons that orbit around the nucleus the same way the Earth orbits around the sun. We call it an electron cloud because it doesn't always have the same shape. The electrons are always moving. 
So it's really like multiple electron orbits, but because there are so many orbits and they're moving so fast, it kind of looks like a cloud, okay? Um, now, atoms interact together to form matter. For example, the magnesium that we used in class is made up of a bunch of magnesium atoms that are locked together in sort of a, a rigid way, um, and that forms a solid magnesium matter. If we were to melt that, the atoms would loosen up a bit and not be so rigid, forming a liquid. Think about uh, the, the last part of the activity that we um, did in, in class the other day with the urea and the water. We took solid urea, we dissolved it in water, so it became didn't become a liquid, but it became dissolved in liquid. All right, And then we removed that liquid, um, and it became a solid again, and so if you think about the atomic structure, when it's in a liquid, um, you know, uh, things are looser. Uh, but as it becomes a solid, things become more rigid. So if you think about ice, this, this is probably a better example. Let's talk, let's talk about ice and water. So this is a water molecule. It's made up of three atoms. One atom of oxygen, you can see here, and uh, atoms of hydrogen, two atoms of hydrogen, H2O. Okay? And there are many different ways you can represent it. Um, this one shows like the electrons and the neutrons and the protons. This one just shows bubbles, but it shows you why water is polar. Okay, you can see that it's got some negative electrons uh, that can increase the polarity. Uh, don't worry about that. Sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. Anyway, so you've got water molecules, and just like atoms can interact to form matter, molecules can interact to form matter too. Okay, so solid water. Uh, so also known as ice, is made up of water molecules that are locked rigidly in shape. And if you add energy to that, heat, you can loosen up that relationship and it's, it's not as rigid and that becomes a liquid. So it can flow, it can move around, but you can't compress it, right? You can't make a liquid small, you can't change its volume. Um, and then if you add even more energy, the particles totally lose all sorts of structure and they become a gas, okay? They can move in any direction, they can change shape and they can change volume, okay? Um, so solid, liquid, and gas, those are the three states of matter, um, but it's also an example of how entropy increases. You remember we talked, when we talked about concentration, when you dissolve something in a liquid, okay, those particles dissolve randomly because entropy increase, increases, all right? As you add energy to a system, you're adding entropy. Okay, you're increasing entropy, and that's going to increase the movement, right? The molecules of ice don't really move that much, but the molecules of gas are moving all over the place. Okay, um, and the urea, we saw the opposite process, where we took energy away. So we had urea that was dissolved in a liquid. We took energy away through evaporation. Evaporation removes heat from the system, and that resulted in the crystallization of the urea particles. Okay, and it solidified. So energy plays a big role in matter. Um, but what even is energy? Okay. Um, it is the, it's a property that's transferable, and it has to do with the capacity to do work, movement, some sort of function. There's lots of different types of energy. The two main types are kinetic and potential. Kinetic is the energy of movement. Potential is energy that is stored. So kinetic energy, you might think of like heat, Motion, sound, potential energy, you might think of uh, mechanical energy, energy, gravitational energy, like holding a ball above your head. It's got potential energy, because if you drop it, it will fall. But once you drop it, its potential energy decreases, because it's got more kinetic energy. So kinetic and potential usually have an opposite relationship. But you can also find potential energy in chemical, uh, chemical, uh, um, chemical form. So... Uh, energy can be stored, potential energy can be stored in chemicals. Um, all energy is stored in matter, and of course chemicals are matter because everything made up of atoms is matter. But let me use an example from class to explain. So this, uh, these are the chemical reactions that made up the baking soda and vinegar lab. It's surprisingly complicated, okay? You've got baking soda, it dissolves into the solution, it breaks apart. You've got vinegar, it breaks apart, and then they come back together and they 
recombine and then they break apart again and you've got water and gas and blah, 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 blah. It's very complicated even though it happens very quickly. And what we saw when we measured the temperature is that it went down, right? This means that the reaction is actually taking in energy because the heat around it is decreasing, just like with the ice pack. That's endothermic, right? The energy is being pulled in. But where is that energy coming from and where is it going? Well, the energy comes from the surrounding air, the environment, and it's taken in by these reactions and it's stored in the chemical bonds that make up these molecules, okay? It's stored in these chemical bonds. Um, remember the glucose molecules from the grain elevator explosion? They're bonds in the glucose molecules, stored energy, like a, like a compressed spring here, okay? And, th and that's the same sort of thing going on here, is that the energy from the en heat energy from the surrounding area is stored in these chemical bonds. So the big takeaway point from this is that endothermic reactions convert kinetic energy to potential energy. They store it in something. In the case of a chemical reaction, it stores it in a chemical bond. Okay. So what about the magnesium? Okay. Uh, it wasn't an endothermic reaction. It's an exothermic reaction. Because when we did this and we measured the temperature, it actually went up. So energy was being released, just like the heat pack, thermal energy. But again, where is it coming from and where is it going? Well, the energy came from the chemical bonds. Just like energy is stored in these chemical bonds, energy is stored in the chemical bonds of hydrochloric acid as well. And so when you add in the magnesium, uh, the energy was released from that bond and it was released into the environment. So the energy comes from the bond and is released by the environment. It's the opposite of endothermic. Exothermic and endothermic are opposite. Okay, so exothermic reactions, the big takeaway, is that exothermic reactions convert potential energy of the bond into kinetic energy of the heat. Okay. So you may have noticed that the magnesium seems to disappear after a while. Um, all of a sudden it's gone, it's just vanished. It doesn't vanish. It actually dissolves in the acid. The magnesium is transformed into magnesium chloride. Okay. And this is because of what we call the law of conservation of mass, which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's discovered by this Russian scientist, Mikhail Lomonosov. Um, and you can see he himself is conserving some mass, if you get what I'm saying. Um, so matter cannot be created or destroyed, okay? But it can be transformed. Think for a moment about how you might destroy something. If I said, oh, destroy this desk, maybe you dump acid on it, maybe you light on fire, maybe you take it to it with a sledgehammer, but are you really destroying any of the matter, any of the atoms? No, you're converting it to something else, right? With the magnesium and the acid, we were converting the matter of the magnesium into magnesium chloride. It changed shape, it changed form, it dissolved, but the atoms are all still there, okay? Um, think about a fire, for example, right? Uh, burning wood in a fire destroys the wood. When the fire's over, it's gone. But it doesn't destroy the matter. The matter is converted. There's energy in the wood that's released in an exothermic reaction. It's released as heat. It's released as light. Maybe it's even released as sound. And that matter of the wood is actually transformed into smoke, soot, and ash. So we've got transformation of matter from wood, then you transform it into ash and smoke, and you've got the transformation of energy. Chemical bonds in the wood are broken to release heat, light, and sound. Okay. Now an important side note is because energy is stored in matter, chemical bonds in wood, energy also cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred. Okay. For example, um, energy from the sun is converted into glucose by plants. Cows eat those plants and convert the glucose into ATP. That ATP is then used for them to build muscles and proteins and stuff. And then we eat the cows and we convert that protein back into ATP, which we use to grow or to move or to sing or whatever. Okay. So the energy, energy you get from the cheeseburger is really energy from the sun. 
because it's just been converted many times over. But each time you convert energy, there's a price. There's no such thing as 100% effective energy conversion. Take a look at the image here. Okay, There's a ton of sunlight coming from the sun. But the plant doesn't absorb all of the sunlight that's hitting it. Some of it gets reflected. Okay, Converts that energy to glucose, but some of that energy is lost as it does cellular respiration. And the cow converts that energy as well, but some of that energy is lost as waste products, right? Like poop and pee and stuff like that. And some of it, again, is lost at cellular respiration. And then, you know, you, you, you eat that and the same thing happens. So you get diminishing returns of energy over time. It gets less and less efficient. I think there's a, you know, it's like uh, you only get 10% of, of all of the energy that is in the hamburger. You're only getting about 10% of it because the other 90% is lost as thermal energy or other types of energy, right? So let me, let me explain uh, with another example. Take the engine in your car. It converts the chemical engine energy in gasoline molecules to mechanical energy. It does this by breaking the bonds in the, in the, the chemical bonds in the, in the gasoline. And that causes little explosions, just like with the grain elevator. And those little explosions move the pistons of the engine, which then turn the axle and turn the wheels. But all of the energy from breaking those chemical bonds, not all of it is converted to that mechanical energy of turning the wheels. A lot of it is lost as heat or friction. About 85% of the energy from gasoline is lost. Okay, And that's why your engine gets warm. Because some of the chemical energy is converted to chem mechanical energy, yeah. But a lot of it is converted to thermal energy that is lost as exhaust or friction. Right, The axle is turning and metal rubbing up against metal you know, that's going to cause friction. So if you rub your hands together, for example, to create friction, you'll feel it getting warmer. Because you're, you're spending energy to move your hands, but, you're, but some of that energy is not being converted to movement. Some of it is being converted to heat, right? For example, imagine you have a box you're pushing. You're pushing one on ice and one on gravel. It's going to be easier to push it on ice. There's less friction on ice. It's very slippery. So the energy from your push is going to get converted on gravel. Some of it's going to get converted into movement. Some of it's going to get converted into friction and heat. But on ice, there's not a lot of friction. So most of the energy from your push is actually going to get converted to movement. Less of it will get converted to heat. OK? So uh, an example of life is the idea of a food chain. I'm sure you guys have seen that before. We've got a snake that eats a mouse, that eats a grasshopper, eats a flower, which gets light from the sun. Okay, not all energy from the sun is converted to glucose by plants. Uh, I, I talk about that here. Some of it gets reflected. Okay, uh, there we go. So not all of it is converted. So the sun produces a million joules. Joule is a unit of energy of sunlight, but the plant maybe only takes in ten thousand of those joules. Okay, and of that energy that it, the plant uses, not all of it is converted to glucose. And when the grasshopper comes and eats it, some of the energy that it's pulling from the glucose from the plant is going to get used to make ATP, but some of it is lost due to waste products, due to cellular respiration, due to heat. A lot of the times, energy transfers lose energy due to heat. Okay, And then further and further, all the way up the chain, so you'll see that the amount of energy that a snake gets from you know, the sun diminishes as you go up the food chain, right? Um, so this is why you see so many fewer snakes than you do mice and so many fewer mice than you do grasshoppers and so many few, fewer grasshoppers than you see flowers or blades of grass, okay? Because there's more energy the, the closer you get to the sun on the food chain, right? It's got to pass through all of these different organisms and each time it passes through, you lose a little bit. Okay, um, so, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> that's, that's pretty much it. <clears throat> A quick review, okay, ba -ba -ba -ba. matter has volume and mass is made up of atoms. Atoms 
are the building blocks of matter. They have protons, neutrons, and electrons. You can have atoms of different elements. Atoms interact to form matter. You can have solids, liquids, and gases. And their structure changes based on how much energy is in the system. Okay. Energy is a property that is transferred and it's the ability to do work. Um, and it's stored, potential energy is stored in many places. Uh, it could be stored in a ball you're holding above your head. It could be stored in a spring you're compressing. Or it can be stored in a chemical bond. Okay, And that's what we saw with the endothermic reaction of the ice pack and the baking soda and vinegar. The temperature went down because the reaction was taking in energy. It was storing it in those chemical bonds. Okay, right there. That's an endothermic reaction. The big takeaway, remember, is that endothermic reactions convert kinetic energy to potential energy. The opposite is true of exothermic reactions. Okay, they convert potential energy to kinetic energy. There's potential energy in the bonds of the hydrochloric acid. And when we add the magnesium, it breaks those bonds and releases that energy as heat. Okay, exothermic reactions uh, convert potential energy to kinetic energy. Okay, the last major point is that mass is conserved. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. And because energy is stored in matter, therefore, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Matter and energy can only be transferred, right? Uh, wood goes from a uh, solid... Uh, oh, sorry, wood goes from like a, a solid uh, piece of wood um, and then you burn it and it gets transferred to ash and charcoal and gas. The energy in that wood is stored in chemical bonds and when you burn it, it releases those chemical bonds, uh, breaks them open and converts that chemical energy into heat, light, and sound. Okay. So, uh, and, and the other big point is that energy is lost every time you transfer it, right? So if you think about the fire, for example, you're burning wood, you're missing out on some of that energy because, well, say you're burning the wood to get the, get the heat, but some of it is also light and some of it is also sound. So, you know, there's a mixture of energy that is released when you, when you break a bond, when you release energy, it releases in many ways, or it can anyway. And so that's why energy can be lost as you go uh, through like a food chain. And as you go up the food chain, it, you lose more and more energy, right? So um, think a, like a cow has to eat a lot of grass to get the same amount of energy that uh, you might get from, uh, I don't know, uh, than a plant gets directly from the sun. Um, it, whoop, if this confuses you too much, don't worry about it. Um, we're we're going to talk about it more when we get to food webs and stuff like that. But I just wanted to show you that the conservation of energy holds true, uh, but in the in the case of a food chain, you're conserving energy, but you're as you convert it, uh, you're losing it uh, as it moves through the food chain. But you're losing it to heat. Um, losing, I guess, is not the best way to phrase it. Uh, as you convert energy, food energy, to maybe growth energy. Some of it gets waste products like poop, and some of it is lost to respiration. Some of it gets given off as heat. So it's not so much that you're losing energy. Rather, when you use energy, it gets converted into multiple forms, and only some of those can be utilized. So if it helps, think about the fire, right? You burn the chemical uh, energy in the wood. It gets released as heat, sound, and light, three different forms of energy. So if you're trying to get 100% of the heat energy out of the wood, you can't because it's going to produce light as well, and it's going to produce sound. Okay, um, so if you're still confused after that, do the reading in the book because most of this stuff is in the book. Um, and if you're still confused after doing that, come see me or send me an email um, because this is important stuff to help build the foundation for this stuff here. The molecules of life. Okay, well, have a great weekend. I will see you guys on Monday.